And what is going on, A-Push people? We have part two of the final exam review. This one is going from 1865 to the present. I'm covering period six through nine. That's 50% of the new curriculum. I want to focus on key terms, people, and events specifically mentioned in the new curriculum as you watch this video. If it is bold, make sure you know it. The chances of seeing it are pretty darn good. And please, please, please check out the videos in the, in the description. And also head over to apushreview.com. I have a study guide that is up there titled How to Succeed in A Push. And also, I have flashcards for all nine time periods. You can check them out in either Quizlet form or you can download them and study from them. So lots of free resources over on apushreview.com for you. Before we begin, it's shout out time. This one goes to my two classes. Thank you guys so much for all your hard work. It has been an honor and a privilege teaching you this year. Don't ever forget you are brilliant and you will do great on this exam as will everybody watching this. Spend lots of time studying and you will do great. So let's get started with period six from 1865 to 1898. The test structure, this is 13% of the curriculum. And essay topics could include comparing and contrasting goals of farmers and industrial workers and successes and failures of reconstruction during this time period. And why was 1865 to 1898 chosen for the dates? Well, in 1865, we have the end of the Civil War. And in 1898, we have the beginning of the Spanish-American War in which the U.S. begins to imperialize and expand overseas. This time period focuses on the Gilded Age, big term we'll talk about, social Darwinism, the growth of labor unions, the Populist Party, you can't forget that one, and continued U.S. expansion out West. Lots to cover in period six. So let's talk about the Gilded Age. It is coined by this dude, Mark Twain. Look at the flow on that dude's head, huh? That is some massive curls there. And what it means is on the surface, things appeared if they were good. So if you were to look at U.S. society, it appeared as if everything was really good. Things are going well, but there were many problems that lied underneath the surface. The political debates of this time period focused on tariffs. Republicans wanted to raise tariffs. Democrats wanted to see them go down. Republicans raise, Democrats down. We have the currency issue. Republicans favored the gold standard, and people like the populists favored the free and unlimited coinage of silver. And we also have corporate expansion, which turns into monopolies and trusts. So businesses get very powerful during this time. Post-Civil War, the U.S. government encouraged westward expansion. And they did so through various ways, including subsidies to railroads by providing cheap land and cheap loans to railroad companies and Americans to encourage westward settlement. And this expansion led to conflicts with natives and treaties were often violated. Remember, as the U.S. expands, there's going to be conflict with natives living there. And we see the near extinction of the buffalo, which will really drastically alter Native American life, as many of them out west were hunters of the buffalo. So what about relations with natives? Well, the U.S. used military force. We see that with Wounded Knee in 1890, in which 300 Native Americans, mostly women and children, were massacred. And they also pursued a policy of assimilation. Now, the Dawes Act is not specifically mentioned in the curriculum, but assimilation is. So make sure you know assimilation in the Dawes Act. And this is an example of the federal government seeking to end tribal identities. And they did so by dividing up, by taking Native American land and giving them to heads of families, 160 acres of land. So this would change the Native American life from hunting to farming. Natives were also expected to change the way they dressed, cut their hair. Native American children were sent to boarding school where they would be taught in English only. All right, businesses during this time consolidated their power, and they justified this through social Darwinism and the gospel of wealth. The gospel of wealth is written by Andrew Carnegie, and he urged wealthy people to give their money to better society and communities. Conflicts emerged during this time between businesses and conservationists over natural resources. Businesses want to get to those natural resources, and conservationists were like, whoa, bro, you got to chill. We need to preserve or conserve this area. Workers during this time were organized into local and national unions. A couple unions you should be familiar with. The first one, led by Terrence Powderly, the Knights of Labor. Just kidding, it's Knights of Labor. And they included skilled and unskilled workers. And the AFL, or the American Federation of Labor, was only unskilled workers. And they tended to focus on bread and butter issues like higher pay, fewer working hours, and better working conditions. Now, let's just take a moment... 
and figure out who has better facial hair, Terrence Powderly here or Herbert Spencer who termed, who coined the term social Darwinism. I got to go Powderly, I think. Oh, I don't know. It's so tough. We should do a bracket of best facial hair ever. The government often sided with businesses in labor disputes. So chances are if there's a dispute between if labor and management, if there's a strike or something, the federal government will side with owners. The New South is this idea that the South should industrialize post-Civil War. And although people are calling for it, many individuals in the South, especially African Americans, were sharecroppers or tenant farmers. And this persisted throughout the South. All right, let's jump on over to farmers. Mechanized agriculture hurt farmers. This idea of machines making it easier to farm is replacing workers. So they got together and created organizations to, to challenge railroads and corporate control of markets. Things like the Populist Party or the Grange. And the Grange is an organization. It's almost like a union of farmers to try to have their demands met. Now, the Populist Party, you see it's bolded. It's also known as the People's Party. It is bolded. It is important to know. I would be shocked if you don't see this on your exam. It's that important. Now, down here, we have a dude by the name of William Jennings Bryan. He has something in common with my boy Henry Clay. They each ran for president several times and lost. So the Populist Party in 1896, William Jennings Bryan runs as a populist and democratic candidate. And the Populist Party advocated political reform and increased government involvement in the economy. And this was mostly farmers. Keep that in mind. This is a great connection, or could be a great connection, to the Progressive Era, which we'll talk about in Period 7. So the Omaha Platform, what were the goals of the Populist Party? Well, they wanted a graduated income tax, meaning the more money you make, the more you pay in taxes. They wanted the government to control railroads and telegraphs. And they also wanted free silver, meaning that silver would back up the value of the dollar in addition to gold, which would help make it easier for farmers to pay off their debts. Many populist ideas were adopted during the Progressive Era, especially that idea of the graduated income tax. That's the 16th Amendment. Now, when we're talking about immigration during this time, we see a huge increase in immigration from Asia and Southern and Eastern Europe. Those are known as new immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. This led to increased nativism during the time. You see things like the Chinese Exclusion Act, which barred Chinese, or the American Protective Association, the APA, which sought to ban Catholics from holding office. Many Americans, many immigrants, hope to Americanize and preserve their cultural identity. So they hope to become American, yet still keep their own identities as well. They want to preserve some autonomy. And the social gospel developed, and this was a Protestant church movement that sought to end social issues in cities. So it's a way to help fix societal problems in cities. All right, city life, let's talk about that. As cities became more crowded, we see the emergence of political machines. Dudes like Boss Tweed and Tammy Hall. They provided services for political support. So Boss Tweed would provide a meal for a poor family. And all he would ask in return is just to have that family support or vote for him and keep him in power. We also see settlement houses, most notably Jane Addams Hall House. And this the settlement houses helped immigrants and women adapt to American society by helping them become educated and adjust to city life. We see discrimination, violence, and segregation was still rampant throughout the country, especially in the South. Again, the American Protective Association, they sought to keep Catholics out of office. Plessy versus Ferguson, that should be bold. I am so sorry. That upheld Jim Crow laws, which made it legal for separate facilities. The idea of separate but equal is constitutional. And activists during this time began to challenge their prescribed quote-unquote place. So they started to challenge societal norms. You have dudes like Booker T. Washington who advocated vocational training for African Americans and women like Ida B. Wells who was an outspoken critic of lynching. So they really began to draw attention to societal problems. All right, let's jump on over to period seven. The test structure, this is 17% of the curriculum, by far the largest time period. So make sure you know lots of stuff in here. Essay topics could include turning points in U.S. history, whether it's the Spanish-American War, the Progressive Era, and the Great Depression, or the New Deal, and also change the continuities for immigrants, African-Americans, and foreign policy as well. That could be a great topic, changing continuities during this time. Why was 1890 to 1945 chosen? Well, in 1890, we had the closing of the frontier, which leads to overseas expansion. We'll talk about that in a minute. And in 1945, we had the end of World War II, and the U.S. begins to shift its foreign policy to something that has never been before. And this time period focuses on U.S. expansion overseas, reforms in the Progressive Era, World War I and World War II, as well as Great Depression, and 
the United States responds to it. All right. So what are some reasons for overseas expansion? This to me is screaming. This is a great short answer question. Briefly explain why the United States pursued a policy of overseas expansion. This is just screaming it to me, but hey, what do I know? I don't write the test. So number one, in 1890, so in 1893, Frederick Jackson Turner looked at the census from 1890 and said, you know what? This frontier is closed. All the land in the U.S. is kind of divided up and, and you no longer can just go out west and settle an area that is not settled. Now, historians pretty much said he was wrong, but at the time, it led to this feeling that, oh my gosh, the United States is fully, we've we fully expanded throughout domestically the continental United States. So now there needs to be a push overseas. You also have economic motives, money for businesses, and, and a desire for increased trade, especially in Asia. And there's competition with European imperialists, particularly in China. Think of spheres of influence in China, and the U.S. does not want to be shut out. You also have racial theories, poems like The White Man's Burden by Rudyard Kipling, which argued that it was the duty of white civilization to spread their ideas throughout the world. The Spanish-American War occurs in 1898, and the U.S. defeats Spain in four months, and they gain Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. And here is Colombia trying on her Easter bonnet, and you'll notice it says world power, and the U.S. emerges as a world power with a very powerful new steel navy. There emerges a debate in this country, and here's an older Mark Twain, still with that sweet mustache. Um, you have imperialists such as Teddy Roosevelt McKinley versus anti-imperialists such as William Jennings Bryan and Mark Twain, who was a member of the Anti-Imperialist League. So they would argue that the anti-imperialists would argue that don't the people in the Philippines deserve to have the consent of the government? The same ideas that the United States fought a revolution for just a hundred plus years earlier. And after this, there begins this long insurrection in the Philippines because the Philippines hoped they would get independence and they don't. All right, the Progressive Era, this is from 1890 to 1920. They advocated government intervention in the economy, seen things like the Meat Inspection Act, the Hepburn Act, which helped regulate railroads, and they sought to expand democracy. Very important idea to know. So we have Robert LaFollette, the governor and senator from Wisconsin, and his Wisconsin idea, Wisconsin plan, initiated things like the initiative, referendum, and recall. All of those are examples of increasing democracy. In progressives, they tended to be women, middle class, and live in cities. So while the populist movement is made up of mostly farmers, the progressive movement is made up of mostly city dwellers. World War I is from 1914 to 1918, and the U.S. was neutral initially, and they played a limited role. Now, Wilson said when the U.S. got involved, they did so to make the world safe for democracy. So it was a very... It's a very big push for democratic ideals to be preserved throughout the world. The U.S. was heavily involved in post-war negotiations. See this in the Treaty of Versailles, which incorporated a lot of Wilson's ideas from the 14 points. And one of his ideas was the League of Nations, an association of nations. I go into much more detail on a video about Wilson's 14 points. Check it out in the description. That is such a huge turning point in United States history or beginning of a turning point. I think it could be very likely to see on the exam. So make sure you check it out in the description. Now, ultimately, the United States does not approve the Treaty of Versailles or join the League of Nations. Now, we have what's known as the first great migration during World War I. And that is the mass movement of African Americans from the South to the North for oppor economic opportunity. So they are moving from the South to the North to work in factories and gain economic opportunities during World War I. It's called the First Great Migration because, yeah, we have a second one. First one occurs during World War I. The second one occurs during, yeah, World War II. Look at you, you little genius. All right, so let's jump on over to the 1920s. We have the Red Scare, which kind of lasts from 1918 to 1920. It was caused by the Russian Revolution, this fear of communism and labor unrest. And we have this dude here, A. Mitchell Palmer, who organizes the Palmer Raids, which targeted radicals and immigrants. So take a look at this political cartoon. You see these European anarchists sneaking up with a bomb behind Lady Liberty, and he's going to stab her in the back. So there is this fear that many European immigrants during this time are anarchists or communists or against our form of government. So there is a push to keep them from coming to this country. So many unions in the country after World War I go on strike, and they are associated with these European anarchists. So in the early 1920s, we have two Quota Acts, 1921 and 1924, and they were highly restricted, restrictive, and they were aimed at new immigrants. It was a way to keep 
immigrants from coming to the United States, a great example of nativism. So let's talk about new technologies in the 1920s. We have improved standards of living, such as the refrigerator, personal mobility, such as car, and the better communication systems, such as radio. Those should be in bold, improved standards of living, personal mobility, and better communication systems. Also, we have conflicts during the 1920s, many of them. We have tradition versus innovation, fundamentalist Christianity versus scientific modernism. Think of the Scopes trial, and we have William Jennings Bryan on the right and Clarence Darrow on the left. And sadly, William Jennings Bryan dies about five or six days after this Scopes trial. Native-born versus new immigrants is another conflict. We just saw that with the Quota Acts. White versus black, we have the Red Summer of 1919, which were race riots in northern cities, in particular Chicago. And we have idealism versus disillusionment. There's this emergence of a group of writers that are known as the lost generation, and they criticize middle class values and consumerism. They can be compared with the beat generation of the 1950s, which we'll talk about in period eight. All right, let's jump on over to the Harlem Renaissance. This is a celebration of African-American culture through writings, music, etc. People like this dude, Langston Hughes, and Zora Neale Hurston are very influential members of the Harlem Renaissance. The New Deal was created in the 1930s as a response to the Great Depression. And it was influenced by progressive ideas. And FDR focused on relief, recovery, and reform to fix the economy. And I have a whole video on this. I have several videos on the New Deal that go into much more detail. Check them out. That's a big part of this time period. And the big impact of the New Deal is that it changed the role of the federal government and the economy. Previously, in the late 1800s and 1920s, really, the federal government took this laissez-faire approach, this idea that they would stay out of the economy. With the New Deal, the government takes a very active approach in the economy. Some sought to limit the New Deal. You have conservatives and the Supreme Court with the core packing plan, which results of that, while others called for more reforms. Like this dude, Huey Long, senator from Louisiana, who wanted to create his program, Share Our Wealth, which would give every family five thousand dollars to get out of the to to spend money to help get out of the great depression by taxing the wealthy you also have father charles townsend who is influential in creating social security so what are the impacts of the new deal many agencies are still around today you go to the bank you'll see the fdic the federal deposit insurance corporation this guarantees your savings up to a certain amount and you also see social security as well it did not however completely overcome the great depression that's really going to be the mass mobilization of the economy in world war ii we do see a very big shift in voting. African Americans and unions began to support the Democratic Party. So from pretty much the Civil War until the 1930s, African Americans voted Republican because that was the party of Lincoln. From FDR forward, African Americans overwhelmingly vote for Democrats. All right, let's jump on over to World War II. The U.S. was neutral at first until Pearl Harbor. And you see that neutral in quotes because they were trading heavily with Britain in particular and the Allies. Now, we have the mass mobilization of the workforce. This is what finally ends the Great Depression. Many ac economic opportunities occurred for women and blacks. They worked both in factories and in the military. And the government encouraged migration from Mexico. We see the Bracero program, which encouraged Mexican Mexican farmers to come to the United States and help out with the economy. Let's jump on over to home front experiences. Unfortunately, we have one of the, the darker sides in U.S. history, the Japanese internment, which was ordered by FDR with an executive order, and it was upheld by the Supreme Court in Korematsu versus the United States. And this, to me, seems like it could be a great multiple choice question, whether it is a map like this or a poster saying that Japanese had to had to leave their homes and go to camps. So how did the United States and its and the Allies, Great Britain and France, win the war? Well, we have political and military cooperation, things like the Atlantic Charter, in which FDR and Winston Churchill of Great Britain got together and kind of planned out for a post-World War II world. We have incredible industrial production. The U.S., there's really like hardly any fighting at all in the war happening in the United States. So they're able to focus on industrial production. And you also have advancements in technology and science, things like the Manhattan Project, which developed the nuclear weapon. And the U.S. emerges as a superpower as Europe and Asia lay in ruins. 
All right, let's jump on over to period eight now. Let's talk about the test structure. This is 15% of the curriculum. So this is the second largest time period. Essay topics could include US foreign policy compared to other time periods. We'll see very quickly, it's massively different. Civil rights compared to other time periods, again, massively different. And why was 1945 to 1980 chosen for the dates? Well, again, 1945 is the end of World War II and the shift in US foreign policy. And in 1980, we see the election of Ronald Reagan and the emergence of a conservative movement. This time period focuses on things like the Cold War, conflicts such as Korea and Vietnam, civil rights, gay rights, women's rights, the Great Society, and political scandals and controversies such as Watergate and things going on in the Middle East. All right, so U.S. foreign policy post-World War II can be defined by one word containment created by this dude, George F. Kennan. He lived to be 101 years old. What a champ he is, huh? How about that? Let's give it up for George Kennan living to 101. And the U.S. sought to contain the spread of communism. So the U.S. basically looked at this and said, you know what, we can't eliminate communism. We can't get rid of communism in the Soviet Union. But what we can do is contain it or keep it from spreading. I like to compare this to, even though it's a different idea, it's very similar to the idea of the free soilers prior to the Civil War. That slavery is bad and... It is okay where it is, but it just cannot spread. So the containment philosophy is communism is okay where it is, but it just cannot spread. So again, George Kennan, he's the dude. He, he wrote about it, and this was very influential in U.S. foreign policy. So the U.S. focused on collective security and economic frameworks that helped non-communist nations resist communism. So we have NATO. This is an alliance between the U.S. and several other European countries. It is the first peacetime alliance in U.S. history. The Marshall Plan and Truman Doctrine are examples of containment, and they provided money to countries in Europe to resist communism. So this is an example focusing on an economic framework to resist communism. The U.S. sought to support non-communist governments, even if they weren't the most democratic. And this is kind of a theme of the Cold War. The U.S. will support some regimes that may not be the best simply because they are not communist. We see this in Iran with the Shah of Iran here. He'll come back towards the end of period eight, Batista in Cuba, who was overthrown by Fidel Castro, and then South Vietnam as well. Tensions between the U.S. and the Soviet Union fluctuated between confrontation and detente, or easing of tensions. And we see that with the Cuban Missile Crisis, the closest the two sides ever came to war and the world ever came to nuclear war. And then we'll see the easing with SALT treaties, or the Strategic Arm Limitation Treaties. The home front during the Cold War, let's talk about that. We have debates over liberty versus order. In other words, how much rights do you have versus how should the government keep order at home? The second Red Scare was designed to root out communists. You have HUAC, the House Committee of Un-American Activities, which investigated the Hollywood 10 and suspected communists. You have Joseph McCarthy, who accused everybody and their mother of being a communist, and Truman's loyalty oath, which required federal employees to pledge that they were not communists. And there is Joseph McCarthy. He's thinking about calling you a communist right now. Just don't look at him too long. He'll accuse you of being a communist. Eisenhower's farewell address. This is in early 1961. Eisenhower's peacing out of the White House. And he warned of having a large military in peacetime. This is the idea of the military-industrial complex, the buildup of industries that require or encourage the buildup of the military. The Sun Belt is an area of the country that grows drastically during this time, and it is the southern part of the U.S. that saw an increase in population and the emergence of new industries, in particular defense industries. Absolutely know the Sun Belt. This grows drastically during the time as people are moving from the north to the south. Protests were common during the Vietnam War, especially as that war dragged on. Post-1968, with the Tet Offensive, a surprise attack by North Vietnam, the Americans begin to think that the war is unwinnable and they protest more. And then unfortunately, we see the Kent State Massacre in the 1970s, in which college students are killed by the National Guard during a protest on May 4th. All right, civil rights, huge part of period eight, definitely know this. All three branches played an important role. And here is a young lawyer, Thurgood Marshall, who goes on to be a justice on the Supreme Court. So the executive branch desegregated the military. That's Truman. That's the role they played. The judicial branch overturned Plessy versus Ferguson and stated that separate facilities were unequal in Brown versus the Board of Education. And then the legislative branch passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which ended segregation everywhere in public and private facilities. 
there was white resistance to desegregation in the South. You have things like the Southern Manifesto, uh, 90 plus, 101, whatever it is, amount of congressmen got together and they wrote and said the Supreme Court was bad. They overstepped its power in Brown versus the board. And you also see things like massive resistance, the idea that schools would rather shut down than to integrate and end segregation. And Little Rock High School is an example of this where there is resistance and the nine black students had to be escorted into the school by the National Guard. Activists use many methods to fight segregation during this time. You have legal challenges, direct action, and nonviolent protests. Think of Martin Luther King when it comes to nonviolent protests. Think of Thurgood Marshall when it comes to legal challenges. And then you have things like the Freedom Ride, Freedom Riders who use direct action to desegregate buses in the South. Post-1965, tensions over philosophies increased. After the assassination of Malcolm X in 1965, many civil rights leaders debate about, hey, what is the best way to achieve our goals? And you see this push for many people are calling for more black power in the 1960s. All right, the Great Society. Holy cow, is this important? I got a whole video on it for you. I got one on pretty much everything. Check it out. I'll walk you through it. This is a continuation of New Deal programs. And the implementation of new government programs such as Medicare and Medicaid and the promotion of civil rights. And you see the Civil Rights Act of 1964, LBJ is signing it. Who was right behind him? That's right, it's Martin Luther King. And the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So it's basically LBJ's plan to make America a better place. It is the height or the zenith, as the new curriculum says, of liberalism. And that means increasing the involvement of the power of the federal government to fix societal problems. This is really the height of of liberalism it begins to go down after this the immigration act of 1965 here is lbj in front of actually behind the statue of liberty and this reversed those quota acts from the 1920s so this ended the discriminatory quota system from the 1920s and it especially encouraged immigration from asia and latin america so we see a much more we see a much higher increase of immigrants from asia and latin america all right, Supreme Court decisions during this time expanded democracy and individual freedoms. This, to me, is a great short answer question. Briefly explain one Supreme Court decision that expanded democracy and or limited and or individual freedoms. You have Griswold versus Connecticut. The Supreme Court struck down laws prohibiting birth control and established this idea known as right to privacy, the right to privacy doctrine that will later be used in Roe versus Wade, which legalized abortion. Miranda versus Arizona, that increased the rights of the accused. Say your Miranda rights right now. Yep, do it. Come on, you know it. You have the right to be an attorney. Nope, that's not right. Sorry, Channing Tatum. Those arrested must be made aware of their constitutional rights. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can. Anything you say or do can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed to you. Do you understand these rights as they have been read to you? You have to say yes or no. So if you don't want to answer questions about your activity... You do not have to to police. That is what the Supreme Court says. So what is the impact of the Great Society and Supreme Court decisions? Well, this helps motivate a conservative movement that will emerge in the 1970s and really come to fruition full force in the 1980s. All right, environmental concerns. This, to me, could be an essay topic dating back to period six or seven with that debate between businesses and conservationists and really continuing through modern day. So although you won't see an essay exclusively on period nine, you could see like an environmental concern or environmental essay going back to period eight. The environmental movement really begins with Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in the 19. 60s, I think, 62, or was it 50s? One of those. Um, and this brought awareness to the danger of pesticides on the environment, in particular DDT and how it infected and how it affected the environment. The federal government responded a few years later with, among others, the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, which was created under Nixon, and the Clean Air Act, which helped regulate air pollution. The counterculture of the 1960s, when you see the word counterculture, you are to think hippies. They challenged many ideas of the parents' generation, whether they were economic, social, political. They embraced marijuana, and they helped initiate a sexual revolution in this country. And again, that helped lead to the conservative movement. All right, we'll finish up with period nine, which goes from 1980 to the present. The test structure is 5% of the curriculum. 
Essay topics, you will not see one exclusively on this time period. Rather, it could be one about period eight continuing into today. Why was 1980 to the present chosen for the dates? Well, 1980, again, is the election of Ronald Reagan, the emergence of a conservative movement, and the present is today. So finally, we're able to cover all history in AP. So this time period focuses on the end of the Cold War, Ronald Reagan, the conservative movement, and modern day terrorism issues as well. All right, so what invigorated conservatism in the 1980s? Well, we have economic problems from the 1970s, inflation, rapid inflation. So people were calling for a decrease in government spending. We have the growth of religious fundamentalism. A very big religious movement was popular in the 1980s. And we also had the public's loss of faith in government in the government's ability to solve problems. Crime was very high in the 1970s. Inflation was very high in the 1970s. And some people said, you know what? The government was not able to fix it as was promised. There are foreign policy failures during this time. The Iran hostage crisis, which occurred in, from 1979 to January of 1981. And this was a reaction to the U.S.'s assistance to the deposed Shah of Iran. Shah of Iran is overthrown and the U.S. allows him to receive cancer treatment, medical treatment in the United States and many, and many Iranians felt that he should be tried for human rights violations. So what were conservative victories? This is specifically mentioned, so make sure you're familiar with this. Number one, first and foremost, we see taxation. There was a pretty large reduction in taxes. And Reagan proposed something known as Reaganomics or trickle-down economics, the idea of cutting taxes for the wealthy, and that idea would trickle down and help out other individuals. We have the deregulation of many industries, so the government becomes less involved in, in many industries. So this is shrinking the size of the government. Conservatives were not as successful with moral ideas, however, abortion is abortion remained legal. And Reagan and many conservatives denounced big government. Reagan famously said in his inauguration address, government is not the solution to your problems, government is the problem. And even though conservatives favored smaller government, the size of the government grew after 1980, especially when it came to the military. And the reason for this is it's hard to eliminate popular programs, whether it's Medicare, Social Security, etc. Politicians, although they may talk about wanting to get rid of it, they find that it's very hard to actually do. All right, so let's talk about foreign policy under Reagan. Early in his administration, he rejected detente. He rejected this idea of easing of tensions. He employed what the curriculum calls bellicose rhetoric or harsh terms in aggressive language. And he called the Soviet Union the evil empire. Later on, he developed positive relationships with Mikhail Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union, and they achieved some arms reductions. The economy post-1980, the U.S. saw a decrease in manufacturing and union jobs, and we see a continuation of the 1990s and really today of outsourcing jobs to other countries. There are debates over free trade agreements, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, which allows for no tariffs on goods produced and traded between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Some claim that that leads to outsourcing. Others say, you know what, it's cheaper products. And also there are debates over the size of government safety nets, such as Social Security. And there have been many debates over reforming Social Security. All right, so let's talk about U.S. population shifts. Again, think of the Sun Belt. The South and the West gained population and immigrants from Latin America and Asia, especially after the 1965 Immigration Act, are coming to the South and the West portion of the United States. This led to many policy debates. You turn on the news today, you can't go a couple days without hearing something about immigration reform. We have changes for homosexuals. In 1994, the Clinton administration initiated Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which banned openly gay individuals from serving in the military. And in 2011, here is Barack Obama overturning that. The war on terrorism was a response to the attacks on September 11th, 2001, one of those defining moments in U.S. history. Most people tend to remember where they were at that time. I was a sophomore in college. I will never forget sitting in the library when I heard about the attacks. That led to the war in Afghanistan. A couple years later, we have the war in Iraq in 2003. And the U.S. entered this, began the war in Iraq, due to beliefs that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and connections to terrorism. So what is the impact of the war on terrorism? Well, there's debates over civil liberties versus government power. Again, this is a continuity throughout U.S. history. When there's a time of crisis or war, civil liberties tend to go down. And we have the passage of the Patriot Act, which makes it easier for the government to wiretap and 
get around the search and seizure Fourth Amendment. And again, this is similar to Sedition Acts in history, whether it's 1798 or during World War I, you name it, it's a continuity throughout U.S. history. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching part two. If it is bold, please make sure you know it. Check out my flashcards. They will help you. Again, that's on apushreview.com. Check out the description for a ton more videos. Best of luck in May. You are absolutely brilliant. And no matter what, don't ever forget, you are more than an AP test score. And um, look at LBJ. All he's doing is just wishing this guy good luck on the exam in May. I don't know why he's got to get so close to him, though. But anyway, thank you for watching. If you have any questions or comments, let me know. And best of luck. Thank you for sticking with me all year. I appreciate it. And um, we'll see you later. Have a good day.